Uh, good evening, uh, everyone, and it's my great pleasure uh, on behalf of uh, Professor David Shanklin to introduce this evening's speaker, Professor Andreas Schachner, uh, one of the most distinguished uh, Anatolian archaeologists of his generation. Uh, Andreas studied in Cologne, Munich and Hajitepe universities, where he came to specialize in Anatolian civilizations, a field to which he has contributed hugely. I first met Andreas at the beginning of this millennium, uh, in the Upper Tigris, where there are many projects involved in the Ilusu Dam salvage projects. Andreas directed the work at Girijano, a site with Middle Assyrian remains on the north side of the Tigris, and we were just across on the south side at Ziyaret Tepe, and there was wonderful cooperation between ourselves, between all the, the foreign and Turkish missions at that time, a wonderful time of international collaboration. The following year, Andreas uh, mapped, remapped, uh, and studied the time Tigris, uh, a fascinating tunnel where the Assyrian kings uh, marked with inscriptions and sculptures uh, their northward forays into Anatolia. From 2005, Andreas moved to the uh, DAE, that's the German Archaeological Institute in Istanbul, and the following year commenced direction of the archaeological excavations at Boaz Kui. He has, of course, written a huge number of books and articles. Uh, many on the Hittites uh, and their capital Hattusha, and that indeed is the subject of this evening's lectures. So uh, thank you very much for being with us, Andreas. So yeah, thank you very much, John, for the nice uh, invitation, uh, introduction, and to you, Greg, for the invitation. Um, it's always a pleasure to present our work also to an uh, international audience. And I will now try to share my screen. I hope everybody can, can see it. Um, and I would start to, uh, to give you a short um, overview of on the Hittite uh, parts of this huge archeological site called Bosque. Um, because the Hittites are only one part of the story. Of course, the major part or the most important part, but uh, they, are, they are only um, one step in history. So where, oh, where are we? We are in the center of modern Turkey, about uh, 180 kilometers uh, east of Ankara. It's about with a car driving two hours uh, to reach uh, Boaske or Hatusha. The, the modern name uh, is Boaske. Um, <clears throat> when we refer to Boaske, um, we mean the modern village or the, the, the archaeological remains of the period um, of which we do not know the contemporary names. So for example, for the Iron Ages or for the Roman period. If we speak about Hattusha, that means the proper Hittite um, period uh, remains. <clears throat> the site is located uh, at the northern uh, edges of central Anatolia, actually at the borders between central Anatolia and the Pontos uh, region, the middle, the middle uh, Black Sea area, to be to be to be honest, um, and it is characterized by very cold winters, dry summers, and a very rough terrain. So it's um, you don't have large areas there. You don't have la uh, large open areas there. There are only very few small plains. It's a it's a rugged country, and so um, it is actually um, far out of the reach of the classical ancient Near, Eza, Near Eastern high cultures. And when in the early days of ancient Near Eastern research in the late 19th century or early 20th century, it slowly became uh, clear that um, one should look for the Hittite capital um, somewhere in this barren area in Anatolia, that was really a chain, game changer and the changing paradigm in uh, terms of human history. And we will have, we will, uh, have a short look at least of how, how people managed to survive in this area to uh, also to sustain a large um, 
as yeah urban uh, site and especially the the capital of an empire but uh, before that let's have a short look on what has been done there um it's a long story of uh, research uh, closely connected also to the uh, relations between uh, Turkey or the Ottoman Empire and uh, Europe and especially Germany. Um, the first <clears throat> uh, endeavors were take were made by Charles Texier, a, Fr a French scholar, an architect, a trained architect, uh, reaching the site in 1834 and presenting it first into a modern uh, Western scholarship. Um, the first systematic excavation started then in 1906 as a cooperation under the um, Istanbul Archaeological Museum uh, in cooperation with the German Oriental Society. And then since 1931, um, it is a project run by uh, the German Archaeological Institute or under an in, an under the umbrella of the German Archaeological Institute. And as a representative of the Institute, you see the four uh, directors during this period. Um, although um, in my talk, I will focus on the second millennium, on, on the site's second millennium history, as you can see on the right in a, in a very schematic um, development shown. Um, there were many other periods also uh, researched and uh, encountered in this area, um, just to, to you have to know that the site itself, the walled city of the Hittites, has about 190 hectares, so it's very big. And within this within this area, or even on the fringes, there are many other periods also endeavored. Um, so by chance, uh, it is good luck that um, you, thanks to the importance of the site in one particular period, the others were also excavated and are now known uh, as a yeah, key site or one of the most important uh, key sites in central Anatolia. The settlement history goes back into the 6th uh, millennium BC when the first uh, uh, farmers uh, and, and yeah, uh, settlers uh, were and are encountered, are to be encountered in this area. Um, the third millennium is very weakly documented. And then of course, from 2100 onwards, um, we have the city of Hattush and with this Hattian, then the Assyrian trade colonies period, the Hittite empire, but also very strong Iron Age presence, um, which at least from the ninth century onwards, was it was one of the largest uh, Iron Age cities in Anatolia. Um, so much larger than the contemporary Ephesus or Pergamon or something. And uh, then Galatian period, uh, which is paralleled by the, by the Hellenistic age, uh, even some Celts probably were living there or appearing there. And uh, now, and especially in the last years, we are also encountering large remains of the Roman period, um, which is very interesting uh, because it's absolutely unknown in this region. A Byzantine excavated in the 80s, and uh, since the 15th century AD, um, we are seeing the modern uh, the villages which are still present. As I said, it started all in the uh, early days of the 6th, 5th millennium BC. I don't want to go into much into detail, but uh, in order to give you an impression um, of how uh, the change, how drastic the change was uh, from these small hamlets uh, to uh, large, to this large urban site, I just want to give you some pictures of a site which we excavated um, about a decade ago, together with Ulf Schob from the University of Edinburgh. Um, and just to make a long story short, it's just, we, have, we are confronted with small short-lived hamlets. There's no tel uh, settlements uh, in, com in contrast to the south of central Anatolia, where you have huge tels like Gültepe or Ajemhög. Um, so probably no political organization beyond 
the individual settlement or beyond charisma, personal charisma of, of a somehow a leader. It's a subsistent, subsistence economy limit to a very regional scale. Um, and that then was changed in the late third millennium to then to reach this uh, huge uh, city uh, outline. Uh, and I will refer to this development in a short minute. But um, first of all, I just want to to more to the to the site, which is uh, due to the topography separated in two major parts, which is the lower city and the so-called upper city. And remarkably, the Hittites already made this separation in their textual uh, uh, heritage. Um, the great temple lies in the lower town. Bükkale means the royal palace. Um, but in the upper town here, especially in this uh, depression, there are 28 uh, temples located, maybe, uh, symbolizing this, uh, the self-determination of the Hittites as the people of the southern gods. This is all then en en encircled by a huge city wall with the famous lion's gates, the king's gates, and uh, Yerkapa with the sphinx gates on top of it. Um, due to the archaeological importance, due to the um, well preservation the, or the well preserved uh, archaeological remains, but also especially due to the uh, enormous restoration uh, work done at the site since the, the late 60s. Um, Hatusha was enrolled already uh, in 1986 uh, on the UNESCO World Heritage List, um, which is in terms of Turkey, particularly early. Uh, Hatusha was the third or the fourth site as far as I remember. And uh, in 2000, that is really remarkable, in 2000, the cuneiform archives, um, which are about 30,000, 32,000 32, fragments of cuneiform uh, writing, um, which were housed at several uh, places or areas in the city and now are uh, stored in, in, in Istanbul, Ankara, Chorum, and Boaske. Um, they were enlisted on the UNESCO's, UNESCO's World Memory List. And therefore, Hatusha is one of the very, very few sites, I think the only archaeological site, which is uh, listed on both of these uh, uh, lists of human uh, heritage. So, but let's go back to the question, uh, how could a large urban site be established in this marginal region? Because really um, the potential, the agrarian potential of this region is, as, has, as you have seen, uh, limited to a small village, hamlet maybe. Um, and that has something to do with topography and uh, the situation, uh, the general situation of Anatolia uh, in the late third millennium. Because in the late third millennium, all in a, 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 a very strong connection or system of relations has developed between Mesopotamia, northern Syria on the one hand, and Anatolia on the other. That what we now know, or what we know since many years as the Assyrian trade colonies period uh, of the 19th to 17th century or 19th, 18th century BC, is only the second climate or the second climax of a much earlier development, which reached already in the late third millennium a, a peak, as we can see now, uh, especially due thanks to the excavations at Kültepe. And what we also can now see, due, due, thanks to research in the last 10, 15 years, that this system then was gradually extended into further into Anatolia. So Kültepe, Kaiser, the Kaiseri area is the entrance area. And then from there, it spreads like a night and neck network into other parts of Anatolia to, um, to uh, secure hands on uh, the uh, resources of the country. Uh, and in this remark, in this situation, Hatusha plays an, an important role because 
as you can see on the large picture, the site is leaned against, against a mountain range, which you can see here in the back. It is not very high, but it's very rough and difficult to, to pass through. And this is, is somehow a border of between southern central Anatolia and northern central Anatolia, at least from the modern towns Kirk, Kirk Kale to, let's say, Sivas. And in Hattusha, there are two passes, two routes across these mountains meeting. Uh, as you can see here, as I indicated on the, in the, uh, on the photograph and also here on the map. Uh, and that is the important point. Uh, Hattusha controls two, two roads. The, the western one is leading to the southwest, so to Cappadocia and then to Konya, to the Konya region, so to Western Anatolia, and the eastern one is leading uh, via Yozgat and Kayseri until to uh, Syria. So this is, the site is, is located at a crossroad, and that is one of the major regions, uh, reasons because of which the site gained such an importance during time. Um, when we return to the site itself, we can see that there's a major turn um, in, the, uh, in the early second millennium, which we reached now. And as I said, I will mainly focus on the, or I will only focus on the Hittite uh, period in this talk. Um, but um, we must now understand in contrast to, to much to, to yeah, reconstructions that the site of the Hittites is not the product of a, of a Hittite decision, but <clears throat> it is the pro product of back to the late third millennium. So the Hittites only took over a living city um, and refurbished that, that is important. Um, so uh, on the right, uh, sorry, on the left side, you can see the remains of the so-called Assyrian trade colonies period. You have here the uh, Anatolian site, then here the part where the colonialists were living, where also Assyrian, old Assyrian texts were found. And the red marked part here, that shows a distance of 200, 300 meters. When we now look on the right side on uh, what happened in the old Hittite period, we see that this, two parts were connected, the site were extended, and, and that is here marked in, in uh, red, uh, several new public buildings were erected, temple, uh, a, a monumental building excavated just recently, the so-called House of the Slope, a monumental building here at Kesikaya, a large granary, which, was, which, which we will see later in detail, and a palace. And uh, in contrast to the periods before, um, the, especially the Assyrian trade colonies period, where uh, in which the, um, these monumental official buildings were designed according to Syrian or Mesopotamian principles, in, from the very early beginning of the old Hittite period onwards, the monumental architecture of the Hittites is, uh, shows indigenous forms. So the, it is an indigenously developed uh, uh, architecture, which then also points, of course, to autochthonous or indig indigenous um, social relations symbolized by these, um, uh, by these buildings. And we will have now a short look on what I, this is all about. The first um, part, and uh, those who of you who might have visited Hattusha uh, might remember, this is the, it is the large or the great temple in the so-called lower town, uh, as you can see here, uh, regular architecture, um, and we can, it, it displays the main um, characteristics of a Hittite temple with a large entrance gate, a courtyard, a columned hall, and then one or two uh, uh, cultic or cult rooms. Uh, here in this case, it is uh, uniquely 
encircled and cut off of the rest of the settlement by huge uh, store rooms or store uh, yeah, magazines. Um, because um, we have to think of these temples not only as a religious building, but also as an institution, as an economical institution. And um, it, that we know that the temples are, uh, owned a lot of uh, land. And um, this then was part of uh, the, the revenues from, these, from this land. They, it went into this, these stores, as well as, of course, um, booty, booty from uh, the various wars. Uh, here in this reconstruction, uh, this is the light green and the, 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 the darker green area here on the other side of the street. That is in another um, uh, administrative building. So we have to keep in mind that especially this temple architecture is unique in terms of uh, the Hittite or Old Hittite period <clears throat> or from the, whole from the Old Hittite period onwards. And remarkably, this building has already been built in the 16th, maybe even the 17th century uh, AD. So at the very beginning of the foundation of the Hittite uh, dynasty. Um, Opinio communis, uh, the Hittite dynasty starts around 1658 uh, BC. And we've, we have hints that the temple was not built much later. Uh, here we have a view of uh, some of these large pithoi, uh, how they were excavated in the 60s, how they are rest were restored at, the, at that point in, in time uh, at, the, at the bottom, and uh, how we also can think of the Hittites transported these large vessels. Uh, um, uh, because we have to think of how they brought them into this, uh, this huge uh, structure. The next point uh, where I want to take you is uh, the, uh, the, the Royal Citadel on Büyük Kale, the great uh, fortress in Turkish, or in, uh, when we translate the, the local uh, naming. Um, it was excavated from the very beginning, from 1906 onwards, in steps and in many, many campaigns until 1966. And uh, we now, in uh, last year, resumed excavations with very promising results in the northern part. So there's still something to do on, on this part uh, of the city, which has mainly to do with the neglected restoration uh, efforts here in the, in the northern part. Um, the temple, uh, as we can see it today, and as you can visit it today, is uh, mainly the structures or covers mainly the structures of the 14th and 13th century BC, so of the Hittite Empire period. And that has many or some really uh, details which I want to show you on the plan, and I hope you can follow the, the, um, the mouse. Uh, here you can see two parallel dark uh, lines, black lines, which uh, are the remains, the foundations of a viaduct. So the king would uh, assumably uh, take his chariot from the opposite hill and drive directly into the, into the citadel, reaching here a first courtyard, then here's a second court, a third court, and even a fourth court. These courts are separated by elevations and by gates. So here's one gate, here's another one, and here we do not know exactly, but here's uh, at least a column hall separated the two parts of it. And in contrast to uh, contemporary palaces from known from Syria or from Mesopotamia, here we have several different buildings, each covering a different function of the political, uh, ideological, and uh, religious uh, structure of the state, uh, which and these buildings gathered by, to, around these courtyards and were, and were functionally uh, connected through these courtyards. In Mesopotamia, it is different. In Mesopotamia, you would have all these function, 
functions within one building, which is then would then be separated by by walls and rooms inside or to the inside, like the 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 most famous example, uh, the, the the Palace of Mari. Um, but here we see a completely different structure, which much more resembles um, the Topkapı Palace uh, of Istanbul or other uh, Islamic uh, palaces uh, known from Islamic rulers. That does not mean that there's any organic uh, or traditional uh, connection between the periods, but uh, there's a, obviously a different approach and different mindset behind these structures. <clears throat> Um, so when we had to look back on the city, this part here is the Bükkale, and this here is what is also with, marked with these rot, dot, red dots and the, the red circle. That's the so-called upper city or Yukarış. Um, <coughs> it was added to the um, to the core city uh, in the second half of the 16th century BC probably somehow around 1530 BC. We have, in several parts, we have carbon datings pointing at comparable dates. So um, it seems that at that stage, um, we can also speak of a, a large territorial kingdom, Hittite kingdom was then turned into a real empire of Near Eastern, uh, super regional uh, importance. Um, and that is really important because uh, it's also not only important in terms of the history of the city or of central Anatolia, but that is important in terms of uh, the history of uh, mankind because it is the only large territorial stage of supra regional importance in history with which had its center in central Anatolia. Uh, all other uh, empires, the Ottoman Empire, the Hellenistic empires, the Roman Empire, etc., cetera, who, uh, who controlled parts of Anatolia or central Anatolia as a whole, had their capital cities at the corners. Um, but uh, the Hittites are much different. And that is uh, really an interesting uh, matter uh, in terms of global history. Um, sorry, I, I, in the at, at the core at at the core of of this new part of the city lies here a large yeah depression in which in which Peter Neve excavated uh, more than or twenty eight temples, <coughs> which uh, he uh, was able to uh, also ex um, uh, date and uh, reconstruct, which you will see late in the next slide. And um, these temples are at least architecturally, architecturally resembling the word of the Hittites uh, who themselves speak about uh, themselves as the people of the thousand gods. Uh, so um, these some gods uh, might have been located uh, here. Um, you can see also a small reconstruction uh, attempt. Um, uh, the question is why so many temples at such a yeah, concentrated area? That is something which is not typically seen in, at any other Hittite site, so it's unique here. And the reason is simply or it's not simple, it's not simple, and there's much debate about it, but one may think, or one can think, that the Hittites brought the, um, the, the gods, figures, and statues of the, um, of the people they conquered here and worship, continued to worship, to worship them here in order to um, fix the, these gods' powers and to integrate them into their own uh, belief system and, and, and believing them to uh, also uh, get somehow uh, the, their, their power into their own uh, hands. And that is necessary because Anatolia, uh, as you might 
remember from, from travelings, travels here, is a very heterogeneous landscape. And <clears throat> we have, or we are confronted also in these periods with a multitude of languages, of religious beliefs, of cultural identities, and to unify them into one uh, political, administrative, <clears throat> and religious system uh, would be in these days even more difficult than today and than it is today. So um, that is something which is here um, clear, clearly identifiable through architecture. The whole thing, the whole city is guarded by these large gates. As I said, the lion's gates, the king's gates, um, they, we do not know how the Hittites named these gates. At the Lion's gates, Gate, <clears throat> there is a small graffiti-type hieroglyphic inscription just saying gate and probably lion. So hmm, that doesn't mean much or doesn't tell us much about the, the metaphysical importance of these uh, structures. Um, the King's Gate, as you can see here, down um, in the black and white photograph, excavated in 1907. Um, and it was decorated with the sculpture of a god, which by the locals was identified wrongly as a king, but doesn't matter. Um, <coughs> this, in contrast to the Lion's Gate, this, in this case, the, the sculpture is on the inside. and maybe greeting the, the, the leaving persons or, or guarding, safeguarding the leaving persons, the kings. Um, that, these are speculations we really cannot prove. Um, but the king's gate is opening to the southeast. So that is the gate you would reach or yeah, which you, uh, from where you would start your journey to Kaiseri, to Kultepe, and then onwards to, to Syria. Um, or Egypt, and the Lion's Gate is different, that is to opening to the southwest, so that is the gate um, where you would leave to uh, reach Cappadocia, Cappadocia, the southwestern part of uh, Anatolia. Um, and together with these gates, because the gates are unique, as uh, are these um, buildings on top of rocks, as you can see here, one example uh, called Yenijekale. Um, these show you or give us the uh, good examples of how the Hittites were able to work stone, to build hugely with stones, and to, to produce, again, unique architecture, because the gates these two gates are the only examples in the ancient world, in the whole ancient world, which have a parabolic uh, uh, cover. Um, and uh, we can be sure that even someone coming from, from Babylon or from Egypt in these days um, uh, would be impressed by this structure. Um, we don't have testimony for such an impression uh, from, uh, from these days, from a contemporary uh, visitor, but um, uh, it was unique. It is some, that would be something someone even from Egypt or Mesopotamia wouldn't have seen in his or her time. Um, yes, and the next building, uh, the crown of the city, so to call Hall and Yerkape is also something one uh, is, is unique in not only in Anatolia or the Hittite world, but also all over the near, ancient Near East or Western Asia. It is a pyramidal uh, like structure. Um, it is 250 meters wide. Uh, it is uh, the, the or length, long, sorry, it's 250 meters long, about 70 to 80 meters wide and 40 meters high. And it's uh, built up, it's a rampart built up with earth. So it's a built structure. And um, this structure has nothing to do with the, with the Egyptian pyramids, um, but uh, these, these glaciers on the outside is simply necessary to avoid the, uh, to avoid the, the soil from, from building. Uh, on top of it uh, runs the city wall. In the center, uh, there is the so-called Sphinx Gate. 
you can see at the right side um, the uh, two sphinxes on of the on the inside of the city. There are two more on the outside, and um, these are copies which we erected a few years ago. The originals are um, stored or housed in the museum at, in the village of Boasque. Um, it was probably used for processions from the temples. Um, the problem is with the Hittite texts. We have, as I said more than 30,000 texts and fragments of texts. Uh, also, uh, most of them are uh, have, have a, a religious contents, but uh, they are very bad in describing topographical details of the city. So we do not know how the Hittite called any of these buildings which we are excavating or which we can show you or which you can see there. And um, that makes it very difficult then also to um, put these buildings into their social, social, social cultural um, environment or, or function. Here you see uh, other uh, parts of or other views are other angles of Yerkappe. And if you if you first have a look on the right side, here at the back, you can see this depression. This is the where the road then turns down to the southwest. Um, this part of the city is built on the highest mount uh, or the highest part. So therefore, I, I, I refer to it as the crown of the city. And I'm not myself, or I, I adopt a topic or a term, sorry, I adopt a term of Bruno Traut, a German architect and art history, historian of architecture. Um, but uh, uh, it is visible from more than uh, 20 kilometers from the north. We, we will see in the next slide also. Um, <clears throat> so it is really built to be seen. It's really to build, it is really built to um, communicate and to transport the uh, ideological uh, power of the Hittite emperor, em emperors or, or empire in order to show their abilities. And uh, uh, through this uh, uh, artificial mound runs a tunnel, as you can see here. Uh, it's about, yeah, here's the, the outer, outer uh, entrance and the inner entrance is somewhere over here. It's about uh, 40, 50 meters long and it's, the only, it's completely originally preserved. And it shows us how the Hittites built um, uh, uh, such uh, tunnels or how they were able to, to uh, build such posterns, which in this case was were used, or this was probably used, most probably used for rituals, but in before uh, this period, so in the old Hittite periods, they were most probably used for strategic uh, 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 or military purposes in order to allow the um, to allow to defend the city in front of, of the gates. Um, with this short introduction, I hope I have given you a, major, a short idea of the city. You might ask uh, uh, for the dwellings of the normal people, which is very difficult to say because we don't have, we only have very few dwellings excavated. And so uh, Peter, Peter Nevis saying, or speaking of uh, Hattusha as a, as, a, as a city of prestige, of religious power, of, of state power, um, is still correct, uh, is still true. Um, when I started, I have to admit, when I started uh, working at Hattusha, I doubted this um, idea very much. But now, uh, everywhere where we uh, start digging, uh, we find monumental architecture, state architecture. So um, I think at least in this respect, he is, he is right. Um, this view from the north shows you again this mountain range, range I spoke about. Um, here you can see Yerkappe, the, the area which we spoke about before. And, um, when we have a general look on the site and we remember the geographical setting on the margins of uh, the real, the, the fertile land of, of Anatolia, um, we have to ask how it was possible 
to sustain this kind of a city? Uh, and this is a question which uh, has been uh, answered or, or which we were able to answer uh, in, in the last three decades by research by Jürgen Seher and myself. And I will show you at least a short, uh, in short, how this was done, because it, it is a very interesting connection between geology, so the, the general um, uh, geographical, topographical and geological setting of the whole area, and engineering. Within uh, Hatusha and its environment, we were able to spot several artificial water reservoirs. So I, what I mean is build water reservoirs. And from the plan on the right side, you can see, uh, uh, you understand that they, are, that they were not very small. Um, each of these uh, uh, distance here means 10 meters. So these ponds are 70 meters long, 12 meters wide and eight meters deep. So um, we have five of them. So you can imagine that they, that they were uh, able only here in the Southwest of the city to, um, to store uh, thousands of cubic meters of water. And the question is, how did they fill these ponds? And what were the ponds used for? So have a let's, <clears throat> let's first have a look at the question of how they filled it. Um, to solve this problem, we uh, drilled and uh, put a tub here. The tub is perforated. And uh, thanks to the drilling, we understood that the geology is, a, is, is built up of several layers of materials of this, the yellow one is clayish material. So there's, it does not let water go through, but you have also levels which let water through. So uh, that was the, the prerequisite. And um, with this tub, we are able to measure the depth of the water table every week. And that is what we do since uh, more than 12, 13 years now. In summer, the water disappears completely. So the tub completely falls dry. In autumn and early winter, when the rain starts, uh, the water table is rising very quickly. So it will fill, or, or it fills, it can fill um, the, the ponds as shown in the reconstruction uh, at the bottom right. Uh, this, the, this up and down of the water table in this part of the town is up to seven and eight meters in height. In other areas, it's not that high. It's uh, one, two meters or three meters. I have chosen this example because this is particularly spectacular to, my, to me. Um, yes, and the Hittites uh, built these ponds, which were not only found to be found at Hattusha, but in every large Hittite city, you can see, you find these kinds of water installations um, in, 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 in different areas with different architectural features, uh, but always using, the, the comp com using comparable geological and topographical situations. So um, that is something very interesting. Um, the question is, what did they do with this water? Because, I mean, uh, you can imagine if when this water uh, is stored there for month and month in the open, uh, it is not drinkable for humans, but it is usable for um, handicrafts or for, for small industries, for example, uh, leather industry, uh, uh, metallurgy, uh, pottery, etc., etc. But the most important, uh, to my opinion, the most important um, uh, use of these ponds was to feed the animals. Because in uh, this kind of uh, area, uh, where only uh, dry fed, uh, rain fed agriculture is possible, it is nearly impossible to extend the area uh, under the plow, the, the, the land arid uh, or the land under the plow. 
so it's nearly impossible to uh, increase the harvest gains, especially under the climatic uh, conditions of central Anatolia, where you have to calculate every 10 to 15, at best 20 years, complete loss of harvest and the devastating uh, starving uh, situation of starvation. So um, therefore, uh, the only way to, to sustain a large population and to increase the population is by herding, by small, by herding sheep and goat on the one hand and cows on the other. And uh, these animals, uh, they are movable, so you can move them around the city uh, uh, easily, but they need a lot of water. And uh, these ponds were mainly, or, or most probably used to facilitate the water for these animals. That is also a behavior or a structure uh, of the socioeconomic structure, which we can uh, see in parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, in the Sahel area, especially until today. Uh, as, a, as a side note, um, you can see here, um, we worked together with Samut Wittenberg, He's a technical engineer and, and hydrological engineer working especially in these areas of uh, sub-Saharan Africa um, uh, and um, uh, Yemen, etc. So uh, that he that was also a combined observation by different uh, sciences. Another feature, which first was excavated by Jürgen Seer and then uh, yes, by Jürgen Seer is uh, are these huge granaries i have only uh, had only already shown that one of the at least one of the granaries was a virtual part vital part of the new construction of the city in the late in the in the, in the 17th uh, later part of the 17th century that is the large picture on the left it's a huge granary uh, where still today hundreds of tons of burnt uh, material seeds are, are stored or are, are laying there because we are only excavated parts of it. Um, and there are also other um, structural models or, or architectural fee, uh, forms. Um, they have, but they have one. In, they have one thing in common. Um, when they fill these uh, pits, these large pits, as you can see in the reconstruction drawing on the. Uh, bottom right, um, they put uh, straw on the bottom and the sides and then fill the grade in and um, then at the end when you reach the surface close level um, you would you would uh, put the, the roof immediately on top of the last level of the grain so uh, that would then um, cause a yeah, vacuum-like situation or create a vacuum-like situation because the uppermost uh, level of grain, when it was would decay, would use the remaining oxygen. On top of it, there's clay or a clayish material which doesn't let uh, oxygen through. And by this means, it is possible to store grain uh, over a decade or even two decades. Uh, and um, that would allow to overcome these devastating droughts, um, which I uh, mentioned uh, before. When these um, uh, store rooms are opened, um, it is rather unlikely that they were only used to feed humans because um, it is too much grain stored there. It is more likely uh, that uh, this, uh, th these, um, the seeds or the, the, the grain stored there um, was used to feed animals, again the animals, because uh, to bring them over the, over the uh, drought period. And by bringing them through the drought period, it would also be possible to bring the humans through the drought period. And these seeds would have facilitated or enabled to start the, the circle of life again, as see, to, to use them as seeds at the beginning of uh, or the years after the drought. So these two installations, the water ponds and the, and the uh, granaries, 
were the backbone of Hittite uh, economy. Um, I'm already talked about um, or uh, uh, or of the clay cuneiform tablets. I just brought a few examples here. Uh, on the top row, um, these are early finds or earlier finds, lucky finds uh, of more or less complete ones. Um, bottom left, that is what we usually find. Um, these cuneiform texts are uh, very um, uh, or were very puzzling for early scholars because uh, in contrast to the to the ones we, we know and we were able to read since the 840s from Mesopotamia, um, they are not written in a Semitic language but in an Indo-European language. And it took quite a while to, to understand this or to um, overcome the blockade in the people's, in the scientists' minds. Um, and only uh, or lately a, a, a Czech uh, scholar, Friedrich Hrozny from Prague, um, was able in 1915, based on uh, pre-works or or, or, or works of other scholars um, to identify Hittite as an Indo-European language and then solving also uh, its, its reading and uh, these texts. Um, these texts were written on clay, uh, on sun-dried clay, and uh, luckily they were, or luckily the buildings in which they were found, they burned. And so these, <coughs> <clears throat> these clay tablets also were uh, burned. Otherwise, otherwise if, if they would not have been secondarily burned, uh, we wouldn't have found one of them, uh, in contrast to, to Syria and Mesopotamia, where the conditions are much different and where we also can find uh, only sun-dried um, uh, cuneiform tablets. Uh, a few kilometers north East of the site, of the main site, outside, there is a rocky labyrinth uh, or a labyrinth of rocks um, with two major chambers. One is here, the other there, um, which was used, as we can see from archaeological finds, since the third millennium for cultic activities in the open or in the, in the nature. Uh, the Hittites took this then over, the sanctuary over, and refurbished it and turned it into a classical Hittite temple with a large gate, with a courtyard here, with a columned hall, which is small, admittedly small here in this case, and the holy rooms. Uh, <clears throat> the only difference is that the holy room here is not covered uh, with the roof, only the, the the first part is covered with the roof, but uh, this is an open air sanctuary. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, what we see today, or when you visit this place today, you see the refurbishment of a of great King Tuthalia the fourth, uh, probably or made executed in the mid of the 13th century BC. But there are traces of already earlier signs of, uh, of these uh, um, yeah, reliefs. <clears throat> Here you can see examples of them, uh, as uh, we did now new um, uh, 3D scannings together with an Italian uh, group of scholars. Um, on the left-hand side, there is the male row of uh, the Hittite gods. On the um, right hand side, there is the female row of the gods, and <clears throat> they meet at the, uh, at the far end of this uh, space here. And you can see it here again. These are the male gods, and these are the female ones. Uh, this is Tutkhalia himself, depicted here. And these uh, rock reliefs, they are in the other chamber, in the chamber B, on the, on the, a little bit to the east, um, which is probably dedicated to the, <clears throat> to ritual, uh, to rituals executed um, uh, after the dead of uh, King Tutralia. 
Um, uh, Yazilakaya was probably used for uh, the inauguration of the Hittite king and probably also for the New Year's fest festivals uh, in March uh, when the Hittite king had to start the, um, the circle of life again after winter. Uh, I spoke a little bit about restoration work in Hattusha and I, will show, I want to show you um, how important that is. Um, because a lot of what you see today is, is only preserved thanks to this uh, restoration work developed and now since the, the 60s continuously executed until the present day. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, or, or on the left hand side, sorry, you see the large uh, dumps, the soil dumps after excavations which are um, com changing completely the topography of a site. Uh, on the right hand, you see what's happening to the deep trenches uh, in winter. They run full of water. Uh, remember the up and down of the um, water table, and that is what's happening here. Therefore, it's necessary to backfill the trenches so in order to get rid of the dump soil and to preserve the architecture uh, excavated. And then on top, uh, we rebuilt the, ex the, the excavated architecture. So this you can see here, um, this is the excavated wall. We uh, put a separating material between on, on the top layer that can be pottery shirts, that can be modern bricks, that can be glass, that can be plastic or whatsoever, uh, or never, you do not, we do not use plastic anymore, but anyway, um, uh, for en environmental reasons. And then uh, we build up the walls uh, until a certain level where we can show the extension of the ground plans. And this is the method which is ex executed, which was executed all over the site. Here you can see again, Yerkappe. Um, it is uh, sustainable, it is uh, easy to implicate by local workforce, and it doesn't cost much. And that is really important in this, in this respect, especially taking the size, the sheer size of the site into account. And another short example is uh, that we tried to um, rebuild the uh, monumental um, or give examples of the monumental uh, arts uh, within the city. Uh, the King's Gate is the most famous one because uh, even in, in 1911, in 1911, Theodor Macridi, the representative or the head of excavations appointed by the Istanbul Archaeological Museum, <clears throat> cut off the relief of the god, uh, but then was not able to transport it it to the museum uh, in Istanbul uh, and then later it, in 1932 it was transported by the German excavations by Kurt Bittel to, um, to Ankara where it is now on display in the Ankara Museum of Anatolian Civilizations and um, then the first copy was uh, uh, built up in uh, 1967 and now the not the present copy has been built in 19, uh, 1994, as you can see here. Down at the right side, there's an example of the uh, comparable work which we did with the um, so-called Lions Gate. Um, so this is something, these, these are efforts to just show the, yeah, the, the greatness of Hittite culture also in, uh, on the site in some places. And last but not least, I want to uh, give a first a short impression or a, a say a word about a project of, of my predecessor uh, who rebuilt or built a, as an ethno-archaeological attempt or project in original size, a part of the city wall in the lower town. Uh, it was built in 2003 until 2006. And uh, when you visit the site today, this is the first uh, um, to see. Uh, it is rebuilt according to uh, architectural models made of clay, burnt clay, as you can see at top right. And uh, we build it with the normal materials or the Hittite materials, which we find found in the excavations. And it's the, it was the first uh, 
uh, one to one uh, scale reconstruction of mud brick architecture in Turkey. It's now, uh, it has uh, found or it, it, it paved the way for other examples like those in Aslan Tepe, in Aschöklehöck, and other places. Uh, and it be has become a symbol of uh, Hatusha. Uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> sorry, so, and um, with these words and another, from another angle, a view again of the wall, uh, I come to an end. I thank you for your attention and maybe uh, you will be able to visit us also at one day in Hatusha when we work there during uh, the summer days. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and now I stop my presentation. Okay, and I can see you again. Uh, well, Andres, thank you very much indeed for that, that, that most wonderful, that most splendid lecture where you've given us an overview and history of the work of your predecessors, first of all, and then of, of yourself. Um, Burzkoy is, of course, one of the most important archaeological sites in the world. I think that's fair to say. Uh, and it's fantastic receiving true scientific um, excavation. Um, I'm sure there are going to be uh, lots of questions. I'd like to start with just one, actually based on your last slide uh, with the reconstruction of the city walls. Is how do you calculate what height the city walls were? Yeah, that is <laughs> that is that is the, 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 exactly the problem. Um, we built or Jürgen Zeer built the city walls on the original spot, so they're um, two-dimensional uh, extensions. Their length and their width is uh, as they were built by the Hittites. The height is the problem. It was cut calculated by architects who are uh, aware and, and uh, trained in building with mud bricks, especially it was a uh, colleague who worked a lot in Yemen um, with the mud brick architecture there. Um, and it's something, well, we did not, we built not to the maximum because um, we, Thanks God we did not build to the maximum, I have to say, because then the, it would have probably collapsed um, at, the, at one point. Um, but um, it is some, it's, it's some, somehow in the middle uh, to say. The problem is that the, um, um, that the models, the clay models, the architectural models give us an impression of the general outlook, but it doesn't, they didn't, does not give us an impression of the uh, relations of height and width, etc., because they are all. So it is a kind of a compromise, of course. Uh, th thank you very much for that. And let, let me say to, to all the other uh, participants, if you'd like to ask a question, do, do please do so. Either raise your hand uh, or put a, a question in the chat. Um, uh, and we'll, uh, of course, be happy to uh, present the question to Andreas. Um, I have another question also based on architecture. Uh, is the Hittite style of architecture something new? Are they, are they building on Anatolian traditions or are they bringing in something from outside? Um, the architecture is uh, a continuum of the Anatolian tradition. So the dwellings are uh, uh, an un uninterrupted continuum of uh, the third millennium's architecture. And only in the middle or when with the beginning of the Hittite empire, we see new kinds of dwellings occur. And that probably points to uh, changes in socio-cultural behavior. Um, the official architecture, the state architecture, so to say, does not pick up older traditions. That is something completely new. Um, and that is remarkable, uh, and uh, that is making the Hittites very unique. So, so do you think they brought that from elsewhere or they invented it when they were in Anatolia? I think um, the question is, uh, did they come from somewhere? That's the first question, the most puzzling question. Um, I think they invented it when they became uh, kings or when they started to found an, an, an territorial empire. Um, I don't think that the idea of establishing a territorial empire, um, which would be larger than uh, just one plane, 
uh, is something which is, an hit, is, is a Hittite idea, but it is simply the development of the political uh, structures uh, in the early part of the second millennium BC. And we see also attempts of integrating larger areas into one kingdom by Kultepe and other sites. So um, the Hittites simply mm -hmm. were lucky, lucky enough to, um, to establish uh, an, uh, first a large kingdom and then an empire. Um, but mm -hmm. they oriented themselves uh, probably according to the southern uh, kingdoms, which they saw in Syria and Mesopotamia. We should not forget that the, uh, that the third Hittite king destroyed Babylon. So he saw Babylon, he destroyed the Kassite, uh, the, the, the old Babylonian uh, dynasty. So um, they were aware of, of how these kings in the more developed areas of, the, of Western Asia um, had shown their power and their, their, their ideologies. So I think that is what, I, what they did. They, therefore, they developed this, this, this autochthonous indigenous styles of architecture. Thank you. Mesopotamian archaeologists, I'm very sorry to hear about these Hittite activities in Babylon, but uh, <laughs> that, is, that is some while ago. Um, now, we've got some interesting questions uh, in the chat. So the first one here is about water. Um, were there other sources of water besides groundwater, for instance, nearby streams or rivers? And was the water used for crop irrigation? Um, there are interest or, or uh, when you come to Voasco also, you would see there are two uh, small rivers, but the uh, problem with uh, runoff water uh, in central Anatolia is that you either have too much or nothing. So it's unpredictable. The amount of water you can use and you can get out of these rivulets is unpredictable. That is the problem. On the, uh, uh, and, <clears throat> and then, there's another topographical issue here. These rivers are much too deep cut into the, into the terrain as to be used by the city. So they, if they were used, they were used north of the, for making mud bricks, for example, in the plains somewhere. Um, so what the Hittites used is the groundwater because, uh, and the, 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 not only the groundwater by the, by the ponds, but under every each or under each of these huge rocks, rocky outcrops um, in the site, within the site, there are uh, natural springs which are purring out of the out of the ground, um, simply due to the same uh, geological uh, situation I described, uh, and this makes this part, this area, this particular spot, so. Um, um, profitable for, for, for use because there you have water all year round in a predictable number, in a, in, a, in a predictable and accountable an amount. And so that secures uh, living there. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, another question from uh, the chat, um, uh, going back to architecture actually. Uh, is there a connection between the Hittites uh, and the Mycenaeans? Uh, are the similar dates of the Lion Gates, uh, for example? Um, a very uh, long uh, discussed question. Um, the, right. the Mycenaean uh, archaeologists or archaeologists working in, in, in central Cre uh, Greece and Crete, um, they, uh, from my point of view, from uh, they have the, the they seem to have a problem to explain how suddenly. Uh, in the early or the first half of the second millennium, at the end of the first half of the second millennium, these uh, complex societies are um, established and developed, and they are always looking for the outside. Um, but uh, it has been shown by different researchers that there are that one has to be very critical about direct connections in terms of uh, transfer of material culture from central Anatolia to uh, central Greece, to mainland Greece. The distances are simply too far. 
um, the, uh, the the Hittites the Hittites only controlled parts of, of Western Anatolia only for a very short time, um, and and on the other hand, the technology to build the to build Mycenaean <coughs> walls like in Tiryns or in Mycenaean itself, Mycen Mycenae itself, um, they are not. They are not. You don't have to look for them in 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 Hattusha. Um, that is something uh, people working, living with stone, can develop themselves and themselves. We see that we see comparable stone um, manufacture and stone uh, cutting in Central uh, and uh, Southern uh, America uh, many hundreds, thousands of years later, uh, and, and there's also no connection. With the um, with the with the Hittites or with other people, and um, the the, um, the 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 symbolism of the gate, because uh, the question was regarding the gate uh, from Mycenae in comparison to Hattusha is much different. It's of course uh, there are lions depicted, okay, but. Um, not more. They, the way they are depicted is different. The way, though, the the they are probably the symbolism is much different. Um, and uh, so, um, I personally do not think that there's any connection between um, the way uh, the Hittites worked stones and uh, the Mycenaeans worked stone. Uh, yeah, so, I, I would even say the, these are human universals. The universe. Yes. Yes. And it, it just, it, it's something in the human brain, I think, that connects these things, rather yes, than, the, rather yeah, than yeah. Any, any physical link, yes. And the, uh, the, 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 um, the technical knowledge um, to work stone is something which is uh, present in human, in the anthropological mindset since uh, tens of thousands of years. So when you look even at Paleolithic sites, Epipaleolithic sites, Gerbeckli, typical at the most spectacular one um, then it is clear that uh, just shaping a, a rock is not so difficult it is for us as as modern people it's difficult it, it looks difficult but also i mean you are in, in great britain are aware of of stonehenge and you you, you are aware of how people Probably, maybe you are aware of from where they brought the stones how they worked it itself it is nothing very um, uh, uh, magical about it. No, it's, it's universal, but it's a great yes. thing, but it's so universal. Okay. Yes, it's, it's, it's in, 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 on the site, it's, it's, it's a unique issue, but it is, a, as you said, it's universal knowledge. Uh, th thank you for a very, very clear answer. Interesting discussion there, too. Um, a quick question uh, about tablets. Um, picking up what you were saying about fired tablets, whether they're fired deliberately or or accidentally, uh, are there no unburnt clay uh, cuneiform tablets from the history? Not one, not one single one from Hattusha. There's one from Kushakla, which was found or which was preserved accidentally. That has to do with the conditions, with the uh, geographical conditions. Um, <clears throat> in in Boasque or in, 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 in the other Hittite, in the core of the Hittite area, we are on highland. We are on a highland, which is Boasco is reaching up to one one thousand two hundred meters. Kushakla is beginning, so the lowest part of the town is one thousand six hundred. Um, so there's a lot of snow in the winter. Uh, there's a lot of rain going into the soil. Um, the the soil is frozen to a depth of a half a meter or a meters even more probably in older periods um, and by these mechanisms uh, most uh, an, an unbaked clay uh, tablet would be would have been destroyed completely or would di disappear into uh, normal earth Turned and um, when you you mentioned that I worked in in Grigiano before I came to Hattusha or I came back to the Hittites actually. And um, when I came back and had to excavate there, I was, it was really difficult for the, at the beginning, because we were all, I was always looking for uh, different colors in the earth. Where is the, where's the floor, etc. 
it's undistinguishable in 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 this in this kind of earth it's very very difficult to trace uh differences in in colors or 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 something it's completely different excavating in this environment compared to to what we did in in northern mesopotamia or what you do in mesopotamia in general Thank you. Uh, now uh, we have another question from the, the chat now. now we, we've already already heard that perhaps the Hittites grew up in Anatolia rather than coming from elsewhere. And the question now about their disappearance, uh, when and how uh, did they disappear? Did they indeed disappear? Yeah, um, just a word for the coming, or that's a long word. Um, uh, there are two, uh, two, two ways to to narrow to get closer to this question one is the old classical linguistic analysis and the other one more new and it's on ancient dna um let me first refer to the linguistic because this is uh, the the most well known um it is by or the reconstruction of the indo-european languages uh, is coming to the result that there's one indo-european homeland uh, to be reconstructed somewhere in eastern eastern Ukraine, the plains of southern Russia, north of the of the Caucasus, unto, up to the uh, Caspian northern Caspian Sea area, and at one point in history, roughly 5,000 4,000 BC, these people were pushed or were slowly pro pushed to move westwards and southwards, probably by climate changes and the people. And one of one part of them, they went into what is today called the Balkans and Eastern Europe, and then reaching, for example, Greece. Others are heading directly south, and then they would have reached in the third millennium Anatolia on the one hand, and Iran, and then further on, uh, India, etc. on the other. <clears throat> this is very shortly this uh, this complicated story. The problem is that this is not um, provable by material culture for many reasons. And so it still is a, is a hypothesis. There's another hypothesis uh, put forward by Colin Renfro and others, Paul Barn, I think, and, and, and uh, looking more at the uh, saying that there are traces which we can follow from the Neolithic at, Ch at Chatal Hoek to the Hittite period, especially bull um, depiction, etc. So these these scholars suggest or ask the question whether Indo-Europeans would have been could have been in Anatolia since ever. Um, that is the, the problem. The main problem is, and this is an un unsolvable problem, that we have difficulties to connect um, language and material culture. And um, that is, is a dilemma which we cannot solve. Um, when we look at genetics, at ancient DNA, then we see that uh, in Anatolia, the, um, uh, the genetic pool is astonishingly stable from the Neolithic until the Iron Ages, or, or even until the Roman period. And only with the Roman period you really see a mix starting something getting changing and mixed mixed up so um this is uh, quite interesting and um, the question is how to bring all these things together i don't know exactly i don't want to make want to i don't want to go too far at the moment because the reconstruction based on the genetics is is based on i don't know 40, 50 uh, individuals from several places all over central Anatolia. So it's, it's not really a statistically a secure number. Um, where did the Hittites disappear? Yeah, that's the next question. Um, we have to think about the Hittite empire as a multi-ethnical, multi-linguistic state. So it was very heterogeneous. Um, at the in, the in the 13th century, we know that there were several um, several disasters or difficulties the Hittites had to face. They were political. Uh, they were within the dynasty. They were economically. There were peak population moves, especially uh, along the southern coast. 
uh, into eastern into the eastern Mediterranean, uh, destroying settlements at the southern coast of Anatolia in Cyprus, but also in Syria or present day Syria. And um, so uh, at the end in the 13th century, many um, troubles got together and that is what the Hittites, what they led to a collapse of the Hittite system. The Hittite state system um, best resembled by the, cuni by the use of Hittite cuni and, um, and this monumental architecture we spoke about disappeared in a very short uh, period of time, maybe less than 50 years and did not leave any trace back. That is remarkable. That is really remarkable. And that shows that um, the Hittite um, elite culture was not able to really change the long durée and the long developments of, of central Anatolia. <clears throat> I hope to have given a not too long <laughs> answer. No, no, no that, 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 that's an excellent. It's very complex. It's a very complex issue and still we do not understand it fully and there's a difference between the northern part of Anatolia and the southern part of Anatolia and southeastern Turkey or northern Syria because in the south um, the parts of the Hittite empire, uh, one could say provinces of the Hittite empire, uh, continued to survive and they lived on uh, as then independent principalities or or in the states, so that's quite remarkable. Uh, but in the north, probably due to the uh, difficult economical situation uh, by the coast, by the by the by the by the uh, geography, uh, led to a complete breakdown, collapse of the system. Uh, thank you. Well, that, that's a very interesting and detailed answer, and it has um, spurned another question. Um, can you say whether the archaeological evidence from Hattusas or elsewhere in Anatolia supports the theory of Renfrew or, or Gimutas? Uh, no, um, I, I'm, I would be very careful to, to, um, to adopt either of these, um, of these hypotheses. Um, and um, for me, it doesn't make also much of a difference. Um, uh, because uh, it is um, it, at the end it doesn't matter and at the end we cannot solve it because there's there's too there are too many gaps in especially northeastern Anatolia archaeologically speaking um, to to fill to be filled in my generation to 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 get a more secure picture so we will still discuss speculations mm. So thank you. So I'll, I'll give you a question which, which I'm sure you'll be able to answer easily. Um, what, what, what's the deepest stratigraphy that you have at Boeskui? The deepest in terms of meters or in terms yes, of history? in terms of meters. Oh, that is, yeah, it's in, in most areas, um, we are not digging very deep, maybe two meters, maybe two and a half meters. Sometimes um, uh, it can reach five to six meters. Thank you. So we have another comment here. So astonishing that the civilizations uh, that were finished off in the Bronze Age collapse, that of those, the Hittites was the one that disappeared completely. Um, although I would add to that, that of course the Mitanni civilization um, uh, disappeared, although maybe um, uh, slightly earlier. Do you comments on this situation? Um, yeah, the, the, this is interesting because um, the, in the, um, or most, most, civilizations or most political entities of the of ancient western asia somehow appears in uh, the old testament uh, so get they were somehow part of the general human um, memory despite the hittites or despite the anatolian hittites because in the in the old testament there are hittite uh, or uh, hitti mentioned but they refer to the hittites in, the, in north uh, western Syria, which are actually the post-Hittite um, states 
uh, which are mentioned also in the in the um, Assyrian texts as Hatti or Hittite, but they have nothing to do with the real Hittites. So um, the, the, the real Hittites um, uh, in central Anatolia, they really completely disappear from the historical memory of, of mankind. Um, why? It's difficult, uh, that, that is, it's, is this probably they are out of the reach of the normal uh, scope or, or the, of the normal um, range of the uh, uh, written cultures and by as such of the of the memory of of these Western Asian civilizations. So that shows again how accidental. The development of the Hittite Empire or the, the, the Hittite Kingdom in general see, can be seen. Yes, uh, th th thank you. Uh, so we've one um, referring to the Bible here uh, that we're guessing that the, the English word Hittite comes from the Bible, from Uriah the Hittite in the Bible, is, is that correct? Uh, well with detours, yes. Um, but this Uriah uh, in the, the Bible is not a Hittite from central Anatolia. It is someone from northern Syria or even from from middle from middle Syria today, um, which was commonly called or these area commonly called in the early first millennium as Hatti because at four hundred years before or three hundred years earlier they were part of the Hatti Empire, uh, but they were not Hatti from their linguistical background. So in northern Syria in this in these days people spoke Aramean. But not and Aramaic is a is a Semitic language, not a not an Indo-European Indo language. So it's completely a dif dif difference, and it's a mislabel <coughs> of of the um, uh, of the early first oh, of the early part of the first millennium BC. Thank you. I have one more question, and then if there's no more chat questions, we'll um, um, thank you once again. So my, my, my own last question is, is there any evidence that the Hittite kings consider themselves divine? No. Um, the Hittite king it's, himself was not divine. Um, Hittite, the Hittite king was um, a normal human. Uh, only when he died, he became divine. And we can see this that own that the living Hittite king doesn't wear a um, uh, a horned cap, and you know the horns are the symbols of or the the, the signs of gods in the, in ancient Western Asia. So um, the Hittite king, when he is depicted as a living king, he doesn't wear a her, a, a horned cap. But when he is died. So when the dead king is depicted, he wears a, a, a cup or a, or a hat, hairdress with, um, with horns. So therefore, we know that he's not considered to be divine. Moreover, uh, it is inter interesting, there's a deep difference between the, the way the Hittite kings ruled and the Mesopotamian kings ruled. The Hittite kings were more kind of a primus inter pares in comparison to the absolute uh, dictatorial uh, rulers of most of Mesopotamia and Egypt. So the Hittite kings um, were Lugalgal, great king, among kings. So the provincial, um, provincial kings, they had a word to say. And um, so that is, it's much, it's much, much more way of ruling in, in Anatolia is much more fragile than um, in Mesopotamia. That has also to do with ge ge geographic geography, because in Anatolia people, the, 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 the ordinary people can move immediately away if the pressure of the state gets too, too much. In Mesopotamia, they can't move away due to the irrigation system to which they are stuck, just to make it very simple. Um, and uh, so the Hittites uh, had much more, uh, from, from a point of view, had much, had much more to, to look for comp um, compromises and to, to find a, an, an, an more equal uh, way of, of ruling. And that is something which we can see in many, many ways how they 
for example, how they designed their, their state treaties. The most famous one is the peace treaty with, with Egypt, etc. So there, in many ways, we can see um, these, these differences in comparison to Egypt or, and or Mesopotamia. But thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, I think that's the, um, uh, the end of the... Uh, uh, there's one more question. Hmm. Um, I believe the Hittites were what we would call a war culture, but I also believe that they made the first peace treaty ever agreed between themselves and Egypt. I think you, you, you've, just, um, you've just mentioned that. Well, this, uh, just let me say with this war, war culture, that is, um, this war culture is, is something which is, um, um, which is a picture which comes out of uh, Syrian texts, Mesopotamian texts, Egypt, Egyptian texts, um, but the Hittites were not more warriors as uh, any other of these people of the ancient Near East. They always had to be on war and they always, war was part of the normal political um, uh, uh, means. <laughs> so um, that is only a modern uh, application or a modern adjective which was given to the Hittites uh, based on very famous textual evidences from, uh, from Syria. Or, and, and Mesopotamia, but um, they, that is only since um, others were as similarly brutal, were not mentioned in this way. So that is something, these, these cultures for them, war was a normal means of politics. So one more question, but this is an easy one. So the question is, it says that Lugal is Akkadian or Sumerian, and I, I, I can tell you that Lugal is, is Sumerian. And the yes. question is, what, what was the Hittite word for king? <laughs> that is that is also difficult. We have a lot of the, the Hittites in the Hittites used cuneiform, uh, and they adopted many many Sumerograms, so Sumerian word signs like Lugal, because that makes writing easier when you know what to have to call. Um, the problem is we do not know what, uh, exactly what the Hittite king, or what the word for king was, because they only wrote Lugal. And uh, so that is, we don't have a dictionary uh, telling us uh, the, the, the equal, equ equivalent for it. Uh, that is something which we, in many cases, uh, are confronted with. Uh, Andreas, thank you so much. So even though we don't know the Hittite word for king, it's clear that you are, you are king of Bar's Guri today. Um, it, it's, it's a tremendous site, uh, a very distinguished um, history of excavation, uh, I, I think the world is very lucky, the archaeologist was very, very lucky that um, you are the director of the site now, these wonderful results. Um, we ourselves are, are lucky to have you here this evening to give them so much of your time and valuable energy and insight. Um, a, a wonderful contribution this evening and in all your work. Um, so from uh, here in Cambridge in England, I, um, I, I thank you and uh, wish you um, good evening. Thank you so much, uh, Andreas Iak Shemla. Iak Shemla, thank you very much for your time and for your patience, for your interest. Goodbye.